So tonight's uh, uh, presenter is Dr. Asim Amjad, and he's a radiation oncologist from Saskatchewan uh, Cancer Agency and an assistant professor for the College of Medicine, University of Saskatchewan, and he trained in Ireland. He's a little leprechaun there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and the United Kingdom. Uh, Seem has been working at the Alan Blair in Regina since 2008 and has, uh, hang on, I got to get my glasses here, specialty and in interest in breast, prostate, and cervical cancer. And he is a prostate cancer lead physician for Regina uh, in, in regards to prostate brachytherapy. And our uh, presentation, our topic tonight is new treatments uh, that are being available in Saskatchewan and that being radiation. And is there more there, a scene that I'm missing? Or? No, I think that's, you covered everything. Excellent, excellent. So behold our presenter. Dr. Asim Amjad. Thank you very much, guys, for uh, letting me speak to you. You you have a great group, and I always remember this. I was training in England and Ireland at that time, and breast cancer new drug came into four, and it was it was called Herceptin, and it was very expensive. And government thought that if they start giving Herceptin to all these women, it will be, they'll run out of funds. So they, they made a lot of hurdles so people couldn't access it. And groups like you, women created patient awareness groups and they came on the roads and pressurized the government to give her septin to uh, women. And hats off to them it made a tremendous change in the outcome of that disease in England. So these groups are very, very vital, not only for information, but also to make sure that we don't lag behind other provinces in terms of technology and resources and all that, which our patients deserve. We spend almost similar amounts per patient in terms of cancer care to other provinces. So there's no reason why any modern treatment should not be available to our patients. And I, I think pressure from physicians and patients both go a long way in ensuring that. So I'm going to start my talk and I would welcome any questions, interruption in between because I want to make it more interactive and I want you to um, take it where you want it to be. So let's see, where am I? Can everybody see it? I can see it. Yes, we can see it, Dr. Uh, Dr. Amjad. Okay, uh, all right. So this this slide we have seen it before and there are some slides which are were available in the previous talk as well but as new people join the talk so it's important to get this out of the way prostate cancer is uh, one of the leading cause of uh, death in men though the overall survival has improved tremendously from 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, but still because the numbers are huge, a lot of people die from it. So this is a very, very important uh, disease that needs to be treated well. Uh, roughly by 2040, they say about 1.3 million uh, people will suffer from prostate cancer every year. So big burden of disease. What are the risk factors why prostate cancer develops? One is the age factor. As we grow old, uh, there are more chances of uh, this disease happening in us, especially after 50. So uh, roughly every decade adds about 10% of more chance of getting a cancer, prostate cancer in men. Then ethnicity, certain Ethnic groups have more prevalence of this cancer, mainly African, Caribbean, and um, 
Afro-Caribbean descent. Family history, it's very, very important the, um, cause of cancer. People who have more than two or three uh, first degree relatives who have prostate cancer in the past, they have more chances of uh, getting this cancer. And recently we have discovered BRCA1 and 2 genes, which are also involved in breast cancer, can also be a cause of uh, prostate cancer. And that has led us to a wonderful treatment called PARP inhibitor, which I will talk later about. Obesity, people who are overweight also have more chance of getting this cancer as other cancer, as many other cancer as well. So there are roughly three stages of the cancer. Cancer that is limited to the prostate or seminal vesicles. It is localized disease, we are looking for cure in this situation. Cure means we are trying to eliminate the whole cancer and with either radiotherapy, surgery, or any other means. The second stage is localized advanced cancer, meaning that it has started to come outside from the prostate, but has not involved or metastasized or has not traveled remotely away from the prostate. It's called localized advanced prostate cancer, and it's still curable. We aim to cure this disease. The third is advanced or metastatic when it has left the prostate gland and has started to involve remote areas like bones, lung, liver. At this stage, probably cure is not possible, but still can be controlled for many years. So first two stages, we are looking for cure. Third stage, we are looking to control the disease or making it less, um, making it uh, possible to live many years, but longer treatment, probably lifelong treatments. So in Canada or all over the world, it's roughly, 20% of all cancers is prostate cancer. So if you have 100 people with cancer, 20% or 20 of them would have prostate cancer. And new cases roughly in Canada, it's about 23,300 cases. This is, I think, 2018's, 2014's data. Uh, and deaths from it is roughly 4,200 deaths every year. And five-year survival rate is 93%. It has improved now up to 97% now, actually. The cancer burden is about 20% of all cancers is prostate cancer, but deaths from prostate cancer is 10% of all the deaths from cancer. Uh, so if 90% of the deaths are from all other cancer, while only 10% deaths in overall are from prostate disease. Majority of the cancer that we see are localized, meaning either they are the first stage that we discussed or the second stage, and that's about 77% of the cases, which is a very good news, meaning that two third of the cancer, we more than two third of the cancer, we can still go for cure, meaning eliminating the cancer, not controlling, but getting rid of it. If you look at how the five-year survival has improved over the years, in 60s and 70s, the cancer cure from prostate was about 68% in all races. In 80s, it improved up to 83% and currently can go up to 99%. So majority can have a five-year survival rate. And five-year survival, why we say five years, patient don't die after five years, but this is a, a traditional number that I, we always uh, look to see to compare with other cancers. So majority of people who uh, are discovered with prostate cancer for sure will live um, um, to five years and can be many, many years after that. Uh, Asim, uh, someone has just raised your hand. I believe it was Dale. Dale, did you hey. have a question? 
Yeah, sorry. Uh, I know you're doing a, a, a general intro of, of, the, the, of the talk, but uh, sort of tweaked my mind here. And I know it was also looked at in, a, in another um, uh, seminar, but um, when you mentioned about the uh, BRCA um, gene, you you were mentioning on um, the prostate. However, the connection with the uh, the breast um, cancer issues, uh, you know, uh, I likely have it. Uh, my my mother had breast cancer. My brother and I have uh, the prostate cancer. So what? What can you um, tangentially say about the uh, about the um, um, connection between uh, you know what should we uh, say to our daughters? Um, yes, on very that, good uh, the same issue. Very very good question. So it's one thing discovering this BRCA gene. It's another thing what to do about that information because we can't currently we don't have technology to correct this gene so if, if we have this gene present we can't cure it but we can do an effective surveillance active uh, effective surveillance is so for instance in breast cancer you can say the woman after 50 we start doing mammograms but people who have brca gene it is recommended that they start their surveillance 10 years earlier so they start Perfect. their mammograms and MRIs at age 40, or even sometimes earlier than that. Uh, and self-examination is also important. And similarly with prostate as well. So if you go after 50 to your family physician for routine testing, just explain to them that you have family history and you want your PSA tested earlier than 50 years, maybe after 40 start test, getting tested for PSA. Okay, well that's that's perfect. Would would there be would there be um I don't know if you can see me or not. Oh, yeah, I got I, I gotta stop uh, change my video. Here we go. Whoops. Um would there be a resistance um with medical expenses? Uh your GP was saying, ah oh, no, the, the recommendation is now is 50. Um don't worry about it. Um you know, no, they shouldn't. I, be. I will tell you, I'm the doctor. You know, if you um, have, and and I I clearly do with with my offspring. Um, you know, please be insistent and say no. I think, please, you know, do the breast examination, obviously, uh, but um, you know the other uh, diagnostics uh, uh, are important. PSA tests, uh, early. Yes, there shouldn't be any resistance. If there is, you should be your advocate and groups like us, we should talk about it and make sure that family physician has an up-to-date knowledge about it. And if even still there is a resistance, you should call the cancer agency, somebody at Alan Blair or even me, and we can make sure that this is should be taken care of. The whole point of testing this is that we do surveillance. If somebody yep. is not doing the job, then you are putting the patient into great deal of anxiety that, who has this gene and doesn't know what to do about it. So absolutely, you should- De Definitely reassuring, thank friend. you, thank you. The other, the other one here, as you're going through it, and I, it almost answered uh, your, your, your survival rate and whatever, but the localized with the uh, ag aggressive, uh, you know, like uh, the Gleason score, you know, those kinds of, um, uh, say, you, you, you do uh, um, just sort of passive monitoring, but um, with uh, Gleason score of so eight or so. Mean. Yeah, so we will come to that in the next few slides that who should be monitored and who should be treated as well. Okay, thank you. Good question. So how is and there is an improvement in cancer and how did we come to here where we majority of the patients we are looking for cure? Other than drugs, the things that are in our 
place. I was talking to Laurie uh, earlier about it. That why we we should have a cohesive policy between physicians and patients about this. That's very very important in getting this disease uh, to a survival rate that is very achievable and high. One is that there should be increased awareness among population and medics, and it has been now groups like you information through Google talking to family people are more open about talking about their disease and their issues BRC genes as Dale was pointing out all this awareness makes you go to the physician early and checked up PSA taken out and disease uh, brought to fore at in localized form where it can be cured. Now we have treatment which is very individualized. What was happening in the past was everybody, we were saying patients have, you have breast cancer, you will be treated like this. You have prostate cancer, you, you will be treated like this. So there were set standards. Now it's not the case. Every prostate cancer is an individualized cancer. You, you, you look at your PSA, you look at your Gleason score, you look at your stage, your genetic structure, your PSA doubling time, all those things are making us cause, making us design an individual treatment, not for prostate cancer, but prostate cancer individualized to your disease. So that has made a tremendous change. Then availability of global data, and it has made a tremendous change as well. By law, every year, College of Physicians and Surgeons in Saskatchewan and the college in, uh, in Ottawa, make sure that we have certain CME credits because we should attend conferences and all that. And we look at the global data and that global data tells us what's working, what's not working, how we can tweak our guidelines and all that. And that has also made uh, a good change in our outcome. Now, there's an increased collaboration between oncologists and urologists. Um, we are not, nobody should be very stiff neck about it. They should be very amenable to talking to each other. And it, it started to come into College of Medicine from College of Medicine admission as well. So we take students, make sure that those students have a kind of a team player uh, mindset. If you are a team player, you can work effectively with other colleagues. That, that is very, very good for our patients. So team playing, collaboration is very important between different physicians and different specialities. Obviously advancing technology has made a difference. We diagnose cancer early, we treat them uh, more effectively. That has made a tremendous change. And creation of treatment guidelines, which are improved every year by year based on global data. That has also changed. But other advances in terms of medication or treatment has changed, improving biopsies by MRI ultrasound fusion. So previously what we were doing, everybody was doing ultrasound guided biopsy or open biopsies. There was no set parameter how the biopsies should be reported, but how many cores or how many samples we should do, which areas should be biopsied. No, they are very cohesive. All the patients get 12 core biopsies, we take samples from six sites of the prostate, top, middle, bottom on the right side, top, middle, bottom on the left side, and we label them very, very uh, in the same way for every patient. One thing we are lacking is that we don't have the facility, at least in Regina, for fusing the MRI and ultrasound. And we are working on it to make sure we do it in a very near future. Currently, we do MRI, we do ultrasound, but we can't fuse them because of some uh, hindrance in our technology. We are working on it. Uh, and that would also uh, change how the biopsies are done. Dr. Asim, someone has a question. I believe it's Peter. Peter sure. Do you want to ask your question? Uh, yes, Dr. Amjad. I was just uh, wondering, is there any uh, discussion in the urological uh, 
profession about doing uh, perineal biopsies as opposed to uh, um, transrectal. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Transrectal. Very intelligent question. Yes, very intelligent question, and we are looking into it. Some some of the urologists in uh, in Moosejo and um, Swift Current they are very vociferous about it, and this is coming in near future as well. So currently, what Peter is saying is that we put a probe in the rectum and the needle goes through the rectal wall. What we ideally so it it has a potential of causing infections and it does cause infection in many cases. If we do perineal biopsies, it is more probably precise. We can take more samples and it has lesser chance of infections. And I think that's the way to go in future. Thank you, Dr. Amjad. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And we have James has a question as well, Dr. Amjad. Sure. Thank you, doctor. It's a follow-up on, on that issue of biopsies and infection. Um, my third biopsy, I had an infection that was quite serious, required hospitalization. Um, and the members here know my story. What I had after that, uh, because my PSA kept rising, I was offered the biopsy, I said no. And then at the time, I think it was 2015, I heard about the... Um, the MRI, um, uh, 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 what, what, I forget the name of it right now, but it was a, a type of MRI with a contrasting agent that was able then to look and um, was with a high degree of accuracy or certainty. Um, and Multiparametric. Yes, that was it. And so what it did, it, it confirmed with the biopsy, the three previous biopsies had identified, but it also showed another no nodule that was in an area of my prostate that was not normally biopsied. And this third or fourth uh, nodule or tumor was actually of a higher grade cancer. At least that's what it showed. And so that changed my mind from active surveillance to active treatment. So... Can you talk a little bit about, could, could you envision a day when we might have good enough diagnost, um, um, diagnostic uh, imaging that we will not require biopsies, which has inherent risks? Yes, so biopsies would not go away. The, the reason is that you, the biopsies, the, the only thing that would might go away is rather than taking the biopsies blindly from 12 different places or six different places and 12 cores with this multi-parametric MRI or fusion of MRI or a PSMA or something, then we figure out where exactly the nodules are and only take biopsies from those areas rather than blindly from multiple areas. Because the reason biopsies won't go away is you want to know what kind of tumor it is, whether it's run-of-the-mill adenocarcinoma or there is a neuroendocrine component in it, or whether what's the Gleason score of it, the grade of it, um, how is there a perineural invasion in it? So there are multiple things that biopsies uh, relate to that can diagnostic cannot uh, clarify. So yes, multi-parametric MRI and fusion biopsies would be ideal, but uh, not, uh, not having biopsy, probably I don't envision that. Thank you. So uh, small amounts of cancer as we are discussing using modern imaging with MRI multi-parametric um, MRIs and PSMA and fusing all those images to outline where the cancer is and pinpointing to those areas definitely has made a changes in our outcome of the disease. This is a newer form of treatment. It's called ARAT, in which loves the word is ARAT. ARAT means androgen receptor access treatment, meaning that Currently, when we give hormonal treatment, it reduces the testosterone by stopping the stimulus from the anterior pituitary. But the testosterone that goes in within the cell, these ARAT treatment are stopping it from multiplying the cells or stopping it 
to cause a DNA production or DNA replication. So these um, combinations of ARAD treatment in combination with hormonal treatment has changing the landscape tremendously. Immune therapy is making a headway in this. Immune therapies are two types. One immune therapy is where it is vaccines for prostate cancer, and we already have that. It's called Spuracel T, which is coming into uh, guidelines very rapidly, and checkpoint inhibitors. If uh, certain uh, disease stimulus has come through the cell membranes into the cells, we are trying to stop them by um, uh, reducing the and the, and the mapping of immune system there. So they cannot act on the DNA to make them multiply. So two type of immune therapy currently we are using and they are um, available uh, in most uh, centers. PARP inhibitors, these are tremendous, uh, tremendously newer forms of treatment who are related to BRCA gene. If you have a BRCA gene positive, then these PARP inhibitors are um, changing the landscape of the disease as well. But they are not, we, these treatments are more when the conventional treatment has failed or has not been as effective, then we go on into these ARADs, immune therapy and PARP inhibitors later on. So there are, that's why I was talking to Laurie that we have discussion every week about uh, almost all patients to see which patients should qualify for which drug. Unfortunately, these drugs are very, very expensive. So currently it's a lot of uh, economic burden um, to uh, treat patients, but obviously as the time will go, they will become uh, cheaper and cheaper once they, the pharmaceutical companies uh, patent time period lapses, they, they should become easier to um, give it to our patients. And targeted radiotherapy via PSMA. PSMA is prostatic specific membrane antigen that is present in most prostate cancer cells. And we can target that um, by tagging with PET scan and I'll explain it later. And this has also been a very, very new treatment. We are currently enrolling in a trial where we will be avail available to trial lutetium, which is a radioactive substance in these patients. And currently we are using it for another tumor in the colorectal called neuroendocrine tumor. But in prostate cancer, we have not so far used it, but in, in very near future, it will be part of our guideline. So this is the same slide that we talked about in America. NCI is the National Cancer Institute, which causes, which gives us the risk factor for prostate cancer. And as we said, age, family history, race, um, dietary fat, all that can cause prostate cancer. So what is the workflow of the patients who come to us? What happens to them? There is no screening program in the world. Uh, we did large trials across uh, Atlantic Ocean in Europe and North America to see is there a reason to do uh, uh, screening in this, in, in this cancer. And it turned out to be majority of the patients because they are indolent or their cancer is not very aggressive. It does not change overall survival behavior. So we don't have a direct screening program anywhere in the world but there is indirect screening. Everybody, everyone who goes to his family physician, indirectly he gets screening done because as part of his physical workup, he would get a PSA done, which becomes a sort of a screening method. So once that elevated PSA is noted by the family physician, an immediate digital rectal examination is done or the finger examination to check the prostate is done. And if that denotes that it, there is some probable clinical cancer or PSA is very high, the patient then goes for a biopsy. And as I pointed out, the biopsy 
is 12 core sextant biopsy, which we take two samples from top, middle, and bottom on each side of the prostate. If the biopsy is positive, then the patient's case is presented in our triage rounds where we decide what, are, what is the behavior of this cancer. So we look at the, his PSA, his age, his Gleason score, which is sign of how aggressive the cells are. And based on his structure of the cancer, we denote them into indolent or aggressive cancer. Indolent means that if the Gleason score is six, PSA is less than 10, and stage is T1 or T early T2, then he goes on to active surveillance. Active surveillance is that this patient's cancer is not aggressive and it's not going to cause him um, a difficulty with health or God forbid to his life for many years, but it eventually will become aggressive. Till it becomes aggressive, we avoid treatment because of the side effects of the treatment. The active surveillance means we are not washing our hands off the patient, but watching it carefully and closely. What active surveillance protocol is, the patient comes with a PSA done every three to four months, his digital rectal examination every six months, and a biopsy done every 18 months to two years, unless the PSA elevates quickly or digital rectal shows us a disease that is becoming more aggressive, Otherwise, that's the pattern we follow. On the other hand, if the disease is aggressive from the beginning, then we go a surgical route or radiation route in combination or without hormonal treatment. And if the cancer then metastasized, then we go on to all those treatments that we discussed briefly before, and I'll explain those treatments later on. So this is the normal anatomy in the pelvis of the prostate cancer. This arrow shows where the prostate gland is. This image is as if you are looking from the side of the patient. So patient is standing firm and you are looking from the side of the hip joints, which is this, this is area which is called pubic symphysis. This is the penis. That's the bladder in front or, or anteriorly rectum behind or posteriorly, and it's stuck right between all these structures, the prostate. And the prostatic urethra or the tube that brings the urine from the bladder into the penis goes through the prostate. So that's why sometimes when the prostate enlarges or it has, it has cancer in it, it encroaches or compresses the urethra, causing difficulty with urine flow, causing difficulty uh, in, in terms of urgency, causing him to wake up more at night, all those things uh, that start happening. This is the multi-parametric uh, MRI in that uh, we were talking about earlier. So MRI is a magnetic resonance imaging. MRI is non-radiation uh, uh, diagnosis of cancer. So we don't give any radiation in, in MRI. It uh, takes uh, into, what it does is there is a whole arc of uh, magnetics, magnets on both sides of the um, MRI. If you have seen, it's kind of a donut that has the has a kind of a circular pattern of magnets there. Magnets, if you remember from school days, it has a North Pole and a South Pole and the, the rays go from north to south. If we change the north and the south pole of the, pro, of the magnets, then different types of images are produced. And we also give some contrast, which is called gadolinium and through this process. And by changing the orientation of magnets from the south to the north and left to right, we can take different images. And over the years, we have found which which orientation of magnets gives us better image. We take images that are called T1 and T2 and diffuse and diffu perfusion diffusion images. All those images give us a very, very better de or precise de definition of where exactly that nodule or the cancer 
is visible within the prostate and those nodules then are uh, targeted for biopsy. So we do routine biopsy. This is our uh, routine in Regina. We do, do 12 cores, but if we see in, on MRI a nodule as well, we take additional samples from that area as well. So MRI is very important part of the diagnostic workup. Dr. Uh, Asim, or uh, Asim, uh, oh Lord, uh, Steve uh, Nagy has got his hand up. Steve, do you want to ask your sure. Yeah, doctor, can you hear me? Yes. Can you go back to the last uh, screen? This one or the, no, the, the last, the last, uh, yeah. I was talking to a friend of mine uh, over the holidays in, in Minnesota, and uh, he's about my age, and he had a transurethal resection done. Right. I, I didn't even know that this could be done, but he was, um, he had some of it, he had the enlarged part of the, now, um, could you explain that? And So and what... transurethral resection is that you, take part of the prostate, in, which is very close to the urethra and chip it off away from the, from the urethra. And what it does is it reduces the pressure on urethra. But that's, if you have cancer, that's not a good idea to do a TURP. It's called TURP, T-U-R-P, transurethral resection of the prostate. We never do it if you have a malignant disease. It is viable option if you have a benign or non-cancerous growth, non-cancerous bulging of the prostate, right. just to reduce the pressure on the urethra. Right. But uh, it's not meant for cancer treatment. Yeah, yeah. he, he didn't have uh, prostate cancer. He was, uh, they found that he had an enlarged prostate and was giving him problems with urinating. So uh, they had removed uh, the enlarged part. Now, I was just wondering at what, how would you be able to diagnose that? I mean, um, would you have to do a biopsy first? No, no. You, from the symptoms and from yeah. the examination and CT or MRI could show that. And we can easily do that from a cystos, sometime through a cystoscopy, where we put a um, camera down the urethra and see it. Uh, we don't need an open or trans. Now we have a laser as well, a green light laser in Regina. And one of our urologists does it where you don't need an invasive procedure. The laser kind of removes those chips away from the urethra and it's less toxic uh, taxing on the body as well. So uh, because of uh, my age and if I'm urinating over in the evening or at um, should I have that um, looked at? Like during the day, I'm fine. And uh, I do- How many times at night you wake up? Maybe once. Yeah. So I think one of a family physician go to him, ask him to do a digital rectal and see if your prostate is very enlarged. Just waking up one, probably not enough. We do a large score, which is called IPSS score. He can refer you to a urologist who can tell you whether there is a need for TERP done or not. Yeah, okay, that's good, thanks. All right. Yeah, thank you. So then there is a PET scan and there is a lot of talk about PET scan. It, it's a nuclear 3D imaging um, where what happens is it, it's a very unique feature of uh, this scan is that normally the cells that multiply, they need sugar for their growth. That sugar we can coat with a radioactive substance. And the idea is the cancer or very, uh, very infective cells, they will be multiplying rapidly. So they'll take up more sugar. So when more sugar goes, more radioactive substance is gone there. And you do a picture of those, you will see a bright light there. That bright light has certain values which we call standard uptake value. So normal tissues have certain standard uptake value, meaning that they will take some sugar in and it won't be very bright, but cancer or infectious cells would have more 
sugar in, the, the light will be more bright. So you can see where exactly the cancer is, uh, which is probably sometimes not very visible on CT. And if it is visible, we are not sure what it is. So this metabolic scan gives us that information. Only drawback for PET scan is that this is not anatomical scan. It will show you that bright light, but that you are not sure where exactly that bright light is in terms of whether it's liver, whether it's lymph nodes or whatever. So you have to do a CT scan at that time and you merge both images. CT scan gives you the anatomical distribution and the PET scan gives you the metabolic version of that picture. So combined together, they give a very good information about where exactly the metabolic activity is. And then uh, we can uh, take inference from that. We have gone a step further even. Now we are trying to see if we can tag a large radioactive substance with this sugar and wherever that then PSMA PET is positive, that large radioactive substance can go there and treat that area, not only diagnose, but treat that area by emitting a very precise local radiation there and killing those cancer cells. And certain, there is a trial coming on which we will be involved in looking at that in near future. Currently, it's being working through the ethical board. Once it's approved, then we'll participate in the trial. Doctor, it's James. Um, so that would be a localized treatment at a molecular cellular level. Yes. Uh, using uh, the PSMA radioactive um, uh, uh, agent, not just for diagnostic purposes, but for treatment purposes. Correct. At the same visit. Probably two same... visits, but yeah, can eventually it will be maybe even one visit as well. Wow. So this is more designed for cancer that has spread to um, bones and stuff. It's because the local treatments with surgery and radiotherapy are already working to very effectively. This is more currently for metastatic spread cancer. So you, these, these are some of the images. So on the right here, where my arrow is pointing out, this is showing that uptake through a PET scan. But as you can see, this PET scan is positive for this disease, FDG PET, but we don't know where exactly that, up, that bright light is. And here is the CT scan there. When we fuse both, this is the image we get. Now we know that this is present within the prostate. The top part is the bladder, which is a normal distribution, but in the prostate, this bright light should not be present. It is telling us that this is cancerous. So combination of a PET scan and a CT scan gives a very good metabolic and anatomical uh, vision of the cancer presence. So this is a PSMA PET scan. This is PSMA similar to what I described about the uh, sugar molecules. We, we have sugar molecules labeled with a, with a radioactive agent, which goes only into the PSMA. PSMA is present in the majority of the prostate cancer cells, and it's called gallium 68. It's a radioactive substance when given with the PET scan, it goes where exactly the PSMA would be present and give us information about tiny nodules that are not visible on the CT or even normal FDG PET. The gallium or PSMA PET will give us that definition. Again, on the right side, we are seeing that uh, gallium 68 PSMA PET CT PET positive but in order to know where exactly it is, we have fused it with our CTs on the left. And the, at the bottom left, we are getting the image that just above the pelvis in the periotic nodes below the kidneys, this disease is present. So combination again of CT and PET and gallium gives us 
a very good information whether this disease has cancer beyond prostate or not. Do, uh, Dr. Amjad, uh, we have had it with some of our fellows in the group have had a, a PSMA PET scan. And what they had had was they, they, um, they were not able to uptake. I don't know if I'm saying this correctly or not, but it, it, uh, it, they couldn't get the results or couldn't get the test done. What would create that problem? Like, is it, there isn't the so, uh, yeah. prostate? Sometimes the renal function, uh -huh. sometimes patients who are diabetic, insulin de dependent diabetic, they have difficulty in getting that PSMA pet in the right places or whose disease is only limited to certain areas that we can't get enough uh, diffusion of the sugar there. Okay, great. Okay, I just wondered why it wouldn't reuptake. Thank you. Yeah, mostly it's uh, renal issues, diabetes that causes that. So this is what I was talking uh, about treatment with radioactive substance. On the left side, you see, this is the uh, lutetium or PSMA PET scan done on a patient. It shows multiple areas that are present with cancer. So many of these areas are normal distribution. For instance, here in kidneys, this is normal because this is eliminated through the kidneys. Similarly, in the salivary gland, this is normal. But within the spine, if you see where my arrow is, this is abnormal disease. And within the lumbar spine here also, this is abnormal. So this patient was given a radioactive substance coated to the sugar molecule. And then this was the result afterwards. You see the spine is now clear of the disease, both in the thoracic and lumbar area bottom and uh, top of the spine. Uh, very good treatment result in this patient. So, so it's wonderful uh, accompaniment of other uh, cancer treatments as well. So what are the available options? One of the available options is if the cancer is localized disease. You can do either active surveillance when the Gleason score is six, PSA is less than 10, and stage is very early. Only certain, some part of the prostate is involved, T1 or T2 disease. Active surveillance we discussed, just keeping an eye on it. And once it starts to becoming aggressive, then you treat it because of the potential side effects of the treatment especially sexual difficulties and uh, other uh, impingement of uh, urinary um, continence and stuff. Surgery can be done. Surgery can be done in three ways. Open surgery, which means that you cut the abdomen open and take the prostate out. It could be done laparoscopic, which is a keyhole surgery, um, where minimal invasive procedure and robotic surgery. You might have heard we have started doing that in Saskatoon and robots take over the surgery and it's supposedly um, more accurate in sparing some of the nerve endings so the erectile dysfunction or sexual difficulties are less. So all these three options are available in the province. Active surveillance, we have many, many patients on it. And then radiotherapy can also be given. Radiotherapy is can be very, very precise in hypofraction, meaning smaller, uh, smaller treatments as, or lesser uh, days of treatment, but large dose in each fraction, or it can be spread out on six to eight weeks. Doctor, the hormone uh, treatment. Oh, excuse me, doctor. We have a question. I think David sure. you had your hand up. He, he, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I had a doctor for 30 years here who has just retired, and he had me check my PSA every three months, and it's been up and down a little back and forth. 
And so he sent me for a, a diagnosis and uh, they found a couple spots on two of my prostates. So that was fine. He's been monitoring it and uh, it goes up and down a little, uh, not a big deal. I'm very healthy. I'm 86 years old and I still play pickleball. So I get around okay, but then doctor number one retired. So I have new doctor now okay. and he sent me for blood check. And I noticed there was no question about my PSA. So I asked him and he pointed to his, his screen and said, after 70 years old, PSAs are not recommended anymore. So where does that leave me? So as I said, screening, some physicians believe that because there is no screening program, PSA, doing PSAs in 70 years old and above makes them do undue um, difficulties in terms of overdiagnosis and all that and anxiety to the patient. But I'm a firm believer that uh, doing a PSA uh, is a very non-invasive test and it gives you a lot of information, especially if you had spots on the prostate, this should be checked. And if he's not willing to, I'm willing to do it, ask him to refer it to us and we'll be happy to take over your care. Thank you. So hormone treatment is where we are suppressing the testosterone, suppressing the testosterone from the pituitary gland or suppressing it at the testes level or suppressing, making it ineffective in terms at the cellular level, all treatment options are available. The, at the cellular level, it's very, very recent advancement as we tell about immunotherapy, PARP inhibitors, all those and ARATs, they are all available here in Regina and people who are candidate for this are getting them without any question. So when patients have advanced metastatic prostate cancer, we give them either chemotherapy or targeted therapy that we talked about, lutetium or PSMA, or PET scan, and some other immune therapy, radium-223, this which is very effective in certain groups of patients, all these treatments are available in the province. So I put this there just to show you that whatever we do is, uh, is in, at par with other provinces. We have what we call a Canadian Urological Association and we are all members of it. And we regularly meet and update our knowledge and update our findings of global literature, what is working. So our whatever treatment is offered is evidence-based and as per guidelines of Canadian Urological Association. This is nerve sparing prostatectomy that we talked about recently. We have a robotic surgery now um, in Saskatoon, uh, which is making headways and getting experience on it. And hopefully we will be able to do any patients who are categorized in that they can be eligible for prostatectomy, especially patients who are less than 70 years old and their prostate is not very, very large and it is contained cancer within the prostate, they will be eligible for nerve sparing uh, radical prostatectomy, either robotic or laparoscopic. So I'm very glad that this modality is available now uh, within the province. So this is radiotherapy. Previously, what was happening with radiotherapy, this is the radiotherapy treatment. What was happening was that we, the technology was not as efficient 10, 10 years or 15 years ago. We were giving a kind of a box treatment, sending um, rays of radiation from front, back, sides, and 
certain limited angles. But now we have machines that have tremendous capability of uh, giving treatment almost up to 360 degrees. And you can see that uh, this red target is the prostate and we can revolve the machine around almost 360 degrees to the patient and all the time converging towards the prostate. If we give it in from multiple angles, it causes a very precise dose of radiation to the small area of prostate and lesser extensive, excessive dose to the bladder, bowel, nerves, um, uh, bones around in the pelvis and better chances of control and limited morbidity or limited side effects for future. So this is another innovation that we do uh, now in Regina that you see we insert some gold fiducial markers within the prostate and we did that this Wednesday as well. Uh, these area that you see the small blip or white substance on both sides. This is image as we are taken from the front of the patient and this image is taken from the side of the patient. We insert these gold seeds there. These gold seeds act like a tracker on a GPS tracker. So the machine hones on to these gold seeds and makes sure the treatment is all the time targeted towards these seeds which is our which are present within the prostate. This enhances our accuracy and we are able to treat a very small area with an extensive dose. And there is a lot of data that more dose you give to the, um, to the prostate, the better chances of cure. Previously, we were not able to do it because our limitation of the dose going into the rectum and prostate, but by inserting these gold seed markers who act as the GPS coordinates, we can enhance the dose and limit the dose to the normal tissues around. And in, in other words, enhance our cure and lesser side effects for future. And this is the evolution of radiotherapy. On the left, you see this was the radiotherapy that was given from four angles previously. Now our machines can revolve around and you can see a very hot dose within the center of the prostate and very minimal doses around. In, in, in this, you see these hot areas that should not get any radiotherapy, but because of the limitation of the machines, these, these we couldn't avoid. Now we can avoid all these areas are very cool and very, very minimal dose there always centered to our target and larger dose there. And this is the brachytherapy that we uh, use to give internal treatment. This is for localized prostate cancer. The patient is anesthetized. We insert an ultrasound probe like we do uh, for the biopsies. But instead of going through the rectum, we go through the perineum as we were discussing uh, with the James before that the perineum is a better chances of uh, uh, getting those there and lesser chances of infection. Needles are inserted through this applicator. This applicator then is connected to a computer and we outline what our target is and what we want to avoid and computer generates a plan where we um, achieve the parameters that we want to. Once it's done, uh, we take the needles out and nothing is left inside the patient. And within three, four days, patient is as good as before the procedure and a large dose of radiotherapy with very minimal side effects is given. This is diagram just shows that how we are blocking the growth of prostate cancer. So testosterone is like a feed for the cancer cells. Testosterone is secreted from the testes by a stimulus from our brain uh, through a pituitary gland. We can block uh, this signal by giving the Lupron or um, Zoladex, or these are different types of injections that we give to suppress the testosterone. Or we can do antiandrogens to suppress the testosterone in combination with these injections, 
because some of the testosterone is created from adrenal gland and fat deposits. And currently, as we, as I mentioned, we have a cellular level uh, drugs available that can stop this testosterone from acting on the cancer cells and, and uh, divide them of any growth potential by stopping their food. And um, all the these three combinations have shown a great potential in reducing uh, the morbidity or mortality from ca prostate cancer. So what are the latest options? This is, we discussed shortly before, what happens is that this is where the patients start the disease. So we have say localized disease, we have 92, 93% chance of uh, this disease curing, but there are seven, 8% that we can't cure or patients come at the upfront with metastatic disease. We give them treatment. They start to respond to a certain time. And when the cancer figures out how we are blocking their growth, it bypasses that block. At that time, then we label them patient into certain categories, whether they are metastatic or non-metastatic. And these are done through various options, PSM, impact, CT and bone scan. And these groups, if they are, they haven't, we can't see any spread, but the PSA is going up. These are the drugs we use, which are called Abratron or Docetaxel. If they, if we see the, if we don't see the metastatic disease, then epilutamide and zolutamide, daralutamide, these are ARAC treatment that we give now. These were not available till a few years back and now our, all our patients are eligible for this. And if they fail this, then we go on to then give them um, immune therapy, then we give them PARP inhibitors, uh, chemotherapy, or lutetium, or radium-223. So all these options are available to our patients. And this graph also shows the same thing, that different categories, we did, uh, define them according to certain parameters that we are looking. All these patients are discussed in multidisciplinary round and we see which group they, uh, they are eligible for. Once we define what group they are in, then we give them the treatment accordingly. So I'll stop here and start the discussion.